Today I'm going to talk about bipolar junction transistors. This is part of my free course in Electronics Technology at Vocademy. The reading assignment is in the description below along with the prerequisites for those of you who just found this video. Before we talk about bipolar junction transistors, we need to review how a PN junction works, so let's get started with that. We're going to start out with a piece of silicon. This is not necessarily how they're shaped, but it gives an idea of how they're made. So pure silicon, it could be germanium, but usually we use silicon. And silicon has four electrons in the outer shell or the valence shell of each atom. And when it forms a solid mass, it forms a crystal where all of the electrons are held very tightly into the crystal structure. So with no free electrons, we can't get electrons to move and have electric current. So pure silicon is pretty much an insulator, even if we do call it a semiconductor, it's really an insulator. But what we're going to do is infuse some material that gives us some free electrons. So we'll start with something like perhaps arsenic, which has five valence electrons. And arsenic fits into that covalent bond but then there's one electron free to move around. However, that electron is still bound to a proton in the atom, so it can only move so far unless another one comes to take its place. But we're going to infuse some of these arsenic atoms, not a lot of them, but just enough, and I'm representing each one with this negative sign because each electron has a negative charge. And when we infuse that in, we get a material we call n-type material, so I'll just put that here. Then what we're going to do is go to the other side and we're going to infuse a different material such as uh, perhaps aluminum which has only three valence electrons and that also fits into the crystal structure but it leaves what we call holes in the structure where there could be an electron but there isn't. And in this case there's no proton to hold an electron there so we have a place in the structure where there could be an electron and these holes are actually quite attractive to electrons and so if there are free electrons around they will kind of hover around those holes and so we end up with a similar thing over in this side where we have I'll just draw circles over here to represent these holes in the crystal structure there could be an electron but isn't in the structure and any free electrons will kind of hover around there and so now we have free electrons on this side too but there's a problem if we try to follow those electrons if we do, we get confused. So we don't follow the electrons. We do something a little different. I'm going to have to talk about something different here for a second. I'm going to talk about golf. This is a putting green at a golf course. Where the hole is, that is our ultimate goal to get the golf ball into the hole. So here's the hole. And we go and we knock our ball into the hole and move on and think nothing of it. But we come the next day and the groundskeeper has moved the hole. They do this frequently to keep the green in good condition so we don't have people always putting in the same place. And we go there and we putt out, pick up our ball and move on and don't think anything of it. We just say, oh, they moved the hole. Did they move the hole? No. The groundskeeper came in and moved a plug of grass and dirt from here and moved it to the where the hole was. So what moved was grass and dirt, not the hole. But it looks like the hole moved. And the same thing happens over on this side of the silicon where we have these holes. As these electrons move from hole to hole, it looks like the holes are moving in the opposite direction. So the holes aren't really moving, but it sure looks like they are. So as far as we are concerned on this side of the material, we consider that these holes can move and we follow them instead of the electrons. Trust me. I've tried to explain diodes and transistors by following the electrons on this side and it just gets confusing. So what we're going to do is just follow the holes, which is what everybody else does. In this side, since we have a deficiency of electrons, we call that the P side. So we have extra electrons here. Electrons are negatively charged, but it's really neutral because for every extra electron, there's an extra proton. So it's not really negatively charged but it has free electrons, so we call that n-type material. Over here, we have a deficiency of electrons. It's not positively charged because there's also a deficiency of protons. There's just holes in the structure that are attractive to electrons and cause electrons to hang around, so we call that the p-type. And right in the middle, we have the junction between the two types of material. 
So over here we have free electrons. Over here we have holes. If we just had the electrons here, this would conduct electricity, and the electrons would carry that electricity. If we had just this side, that would conduct electricity, but it's the holes that are carrying the charge, so it's a different mechanism. So we call the electrons in the inside the majority carriers, because that's the majority of charge carriers over there. In the P side, we have holes, and those are the majority carriers because they carry the majority of the current. Now, of course, we could have a few holes over here, two ways those can happen, maybe flaws in the crystal structure, or just heat will cause an electron to jump out of the crystal structure, and now there's an electron here and a hole there, and they'll either recombine or another electron will come in, and then the hole and the electron are no longer there. But sometimes there are a few holes over here, and we call those minority carriers. And just like over here, we might have an electron that's a stray over here, and normally the holes carry the charge, but we might have an electron occasionally, and we call those minority carriers. We'll talk about that at another point, though, just pointing that out. So here we have the structure. Now let's see what happens if we just leave it alone. Well, just by itself, I'm going to put some more electrons right here next to the junction, some more holes here right next to the junction. Now each of these electrons has a proton in its atom that's attracting it over there, but it is free to move around as long as it doesn't go too far. Over here we have these holes in the crystal structure which are very attractive to electrons, and these electrons that are real close to the holes over here right at the junction will jump into those holes. That one there, that one there, that one there. When that electron goes into the hole, the electron's gone and the hole's gone. It's like we take a piece of dirt and fill in that hole at the golf course, the hole's not there anymore, is it? Neither is the dirt. We just have the green. So near the junction, we have an area we call the depletion region. I'll just call that a DR, because it's been depleted of charge carriers. Now let's put a charge on here. we put some contacts. And we're going to put a positive charge on the inside and a negative charge on the P side. What does that mean? It means I have a battery up here. So positive to the inside, negative to the P side, nothing more than that. We'll just erase this, we know what we mean. So what's going to happen? Well, this positive charge is very attractive to these electrons, so these electrons are going to move away from the junction. It's going to suck them over there. It's almost like an electron vacuum. In fact, that'll come into play a little later. Over here we have a negative charge, and it's very attractive to these holes. So these holes will move away from the junction. Now, of course, it's really electrons moving the opposite direction, but like I said, if we try to follow those electrons, we will get confused. So we'll just follow the holes. So by putting negative on the P side, I'm going to erase these and put them up here. Negative on the P side and positive on the inside, we make that depletion region even bigger. Now let's reverse this charge. Positive on the P side, Negative on the inside, of course, that means it goes to a battery. And so what's going to happen is just the opposite. Let me redraw these electrons and holes in here. Well, this positive charge is going to push holes that direction. This negative charge is going to push electrons that direction, so it's going to push them closer to the junction. And a little bit of charge is going to push them a little bit closer, but we're still not going to have any conduction in there because we still have a depletion region. But we shrink that depletion region enough, and what's going to happen is that we're going to have more electrons jump into more holes, and those electrons are replaced by new ones over here. And of course, when these electrons jumped into the holes, the electrons in the holes were gone, but the positive charge injects more holes over here. So we have a flow of charges toward the junction, and when we get to the junction, the electrons start jumping into the holes, and so more electrons and more holes replace them, and so we have a current. And the stronger we make this, the smaller that depletion region gets, and the more 
action we have of more electrons jumping into more holes, more of them are replaced and we get more and more current. So when we had them reverse biased, positive to the N side, negative to the P side, that's reverse biased, the depletion region got bigger, so it got even less conductive. But then when we put positive on the P, negative on the N, it pushes them together and it begins to conduct. The more we put there, it's even more conductive. Went into more details in the lecture about diodes, about the characteristics, but this is the basic part we need to know and review to start talking about bipolar junction transistors.